I heard a story recently of, of a guy who kind of wasn't giving his wife like the, the, the recognition, the kindness, the love that she needed and deserved, and his name was Harry. And so Harry was at work one day, and he just kind of decided, you know what, I'm going to change my ways. I'm going to tell my wife how precious she is, how much I love her. And so on his way home from work, he picked up a dozen roses and a box of chocolates, gets to the house. Instead of going in the garage like he normally would do, he goes around to the front door, rings the doorbell. And when his wife comes to the door, he's singing to his wife, I love you, I truly love you. And his wife burst into tears. And you know, guys, we can tell the difference between tears of joy and tears that are signaling you've done something wrong. And for Harry, he knew these were not tears of joy. He had done something wrong. And he said, honey, well, like, what's going on? What's wrong? And she said, oh, Harry, it's been the worst day. The plumbing busted. I've been repairing a leak all day. The car broke down. The house is a disaster. The kids are possessed by the devil. And then you come home drunk. <laughs> so moms, across all of our campuses, hopefully you have a better day than that. But may I say on behalf of our senior pastor, Jeff, and his wife, Michelle, and all of our church family, we love you. We truly do. And we hope that today you, you feel that. And we understand that across our campuses and in every space, we have moms that come from all different walks of life. We have working moms and stay-at-home moms and single moms. Maybe you're a grandmom. I heard that's when life really begins. Uh, maybe you're a new or expectant mom. And on behalf of all of us who have kids of any age, we smile and congratulate you because you are not going to sleep again for the next 10 years. So congratulations. <laughs> but we also understand that Mother's Day, is, it's a bittersweet day. It's a bittersweet day because there may be some of you joining us today that you're hopeful to become a mom, but for you, it hasn't happened yet. And you've been trying and believing and you're waiting for that day. And can I just say that we are behind you, we're cheering for you, we're believing with you that that family is going to come into your life as well. And maybe for some, this is the first Mother's Day without mom. Maybe for others, it's the first Mother's Day without a child. And perhaps it's because of miles or perhaps it's because of loss. And what I want to say to you and what I believe that the Lord wants to remind you of is that he draws close to the brokenhearted. That when we feel pain, God is always present. He always pulls close. And I just want to encourage you today that I believe today God has something to say to you. I believe he wants to encourage you today. And we're so glad that you're here. You know, when you're in ministry and you do kind of what I do for a living and, and anytime you stand on stages like this and publicly speak, one of the things that you get from time to time is unsolicited advice. Anybody ever get unsolicited advice? Like, don't ever wear that again. You know, that, that's not very flattering. All that kind of stuff makes you really feel encouraged. And leading up to today, I got some unsolicited to advice. And it was from, from a lady, and she's a wonderful woman, but she told me, she said, hey, just two things. I know you're speaking on Mother's Day. Can you just do two things? One, don't talk about parenting. We don't care on Mother's Day. <laughs> and two, whatever you do, please don't talk about Proverbs chapter 31. We've all heard that before. So if you have your Bible, would you open it up with me to Proverbs chapter 31, please? <laughs> and we're going to explore what the Bible has to say, because in Proverbs chapter 31, there is this section of the Bible that shines a spotlight on the leading ladies of our lives, the mom and the women in our lives. And I'm willing to bet that if you're anything like me, most of the time you've, you've at some point read this latter portion of Proverbs 31, and you've read it in not an incorrect way, but I would argue an incomplete way. And it's like almost you see it as this list of things that you just can't seem to measure up to. And what I want to help you do today is to view it through a different lens. Because the book of Proverbs, the entire book, was written in the Jewish culture to teach young men how to live with wisdom. And all throughout, wisdom is personified in the book of Proverbs as a female. Because we all know, and they knew in the ancient times, that if you want anything done right, you got to get a woman to do it. In Proverbs, its wisdom is personified as a woman, and it's fitting, I believe, on a day like Mother's Day for many of us to like, learn wisdom and virtues because for most of us, we were taught virtues from our mom. Maybe for you, your mom taught you patience when she said, you just wait until your father gets home. <laughs> Perhaps for some, you, you had the value of a job well done taught to you by your mom where she said, if you're, listen, if you're going to kill each other, can you go outside and do it because we just had the house cleaned? Maybe the value of religion was taught to you. You better pray that that comes out of the carpet, young man. 
Perhaps your mom taught you that time travel was possible, like my mom did when she said, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. <laughs> Maybe your mom taught you virtues like logic when she said, because I said so, that's why. Or perhaps you learned irony from your mom when she said, keep crying and I will give you something to cry about. Anybody else heard that one? Or maybe for, for you, your mom taught you the virtue of justice when she said, I hope that one day your kids turn out just like you were when you were a kid. However you learned your virtues, today we're going to explore in Proverbs 31 the virtue of wisdom. And here's what the Bible says. We're going to start reading together in chapter 31, verse 10. Here's what the scripture says. It says, a good woman is hard to find and worth far more than diamonds. Her husband trusts her without reserve and never has reason to regret it. See, most people don't realize a few things about this chapter in the book of Proverbs. And I want to give you three things that maybe you don't realize. And here's the first one. Is that Proverbs chapter 31, the latter portion of it, is written as a poem. It's a poem. The latter half of Proverbs 31 is written to communicate the tangible expression of the virtue of wisdom, but it's written as a piece of poetry. And there's something really fascinating about this piece of poetry, is that if you knew the Hebrew alphabet and you looked at this, this proverb, you would see that each verse begins with a letter from the Hebrew alphabet in succession. So if you knew what you were looking for and you looked at this, this uh, proverb as a whole piece of poetry, you would see that every letter was represented in succession. And one reason that they did this is to communicate that when a woman or a person lives this way, when the woman that you call mom or the leading lady of your life, when she lives this way, it represents that this is a woman who is whole. It's a person who's whole. But it's something else really interesting is that when it lists out all of the things that this amazing female does, it lists them out. And while it's represented that way, the things that are listed out, I would argue that some women may consider these things to be ordinary. Let me explain. Because of the woman that's described here, it's described as a woman who leads a company. She takes care of people. She takes care of her husband, which we know is no ordinary feat, ladies. They raise children. They prepare things at home. She also is respected in the community. This female does so many different things. And if this female is anything like my wife, sometimes my wife who does extraordinary things, just like all of you ladies do, sometimes she views those extraordinary things that she does as average and ordinary. While I may see them through the lens of just how amazing they are, sometimes she doesn't see them the same way. And oftentimes, she sees them as just going through the motions of her life, almost checking boxes of her life, if you will. And the Bible says that when we live our lives in ways that to us may seem average, ordinary, and everyday, but when we live those being faithful to the Lord, that that's actually a part of making our lives whole. God brings a sense of richness and totality in your life, and he strengthens your soul when you live your life faithful to him. When, when I was a kid, I have a younger brother. He's about five years younger. And every year, a couple times a year, we would look forward to family vacations. And we would normally go to like a certain beach in Florida that was kind of the Redneck Riviera down there. And that's kind of where we usually hung out. But this one particular year, kind of the mid-90s, we took a trip out west, went to Arizona. We toured the desert of Arizona. We saw everything out there, and it was, it was incredible. And one morning, we got up to start our day in the desert, and my mom walks out of her hotel, or the hotel room, and she was dressed nice. She had on like kind of, I guess, her desert best. I don't know how you would say, but she just looked great, man. She was, she was, she was nice. And then a few minutes later, my brother comes out of our room. And when he walks out, he walks out right beside my mom. And I look at my brother, and I look at my mom, and I realize that they are dressed identical. <laughs> exactly the same. And I knew that you guys probably wouldn't believe me, so I actually brought a picture to show you guys. This is from Family Vacation, like 94, 95. I think we've got that. We're going to show it to you guys right now. This is my mom and my brother. This is like day four, the greatest vacation I ever went on, right? And when I saw my brother come out, I noticed two things. One is as an older sibling, I don't know if you realize this, older siblings, but you and I were born with the spiritual gift to torture our younger siblings. And so I just sort of stepped into that gifting. I just felt the Holy Spirit come on me, and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this, Lord. And so I just started encouraging him. Andy, you have never looked better. Do that yellow shirt. It just pops in the desert, right? Those denim shorts, woo! And y'all know y'all wore some of those too, right? 
had the braided belt, kind of tie it, let it run down the side. Y'all know, it's looking, looking fly. And so I was just encouraging him because what I didn't want him to do was change. I wanted to go all day long with them as Twinkies. So I noticed that in my brother. Here's what happened is it worked. It worked. He has turned out to be a very well-adjusted man. But at the time, I had him convinced that the coolest thing that you could do is dress just like your mom. And I immediately took both of those pictures because I knew one day he's going to try to get married and I'm going to show this to his potential spouse. And every date that comes along, let me say, it worked. I think that picture went in his high school yearbook. (laughs) But the other person that I noticed was my mom. And while Andy was kind of excited, as soon as my mom saw that my brother looked just like her, there was something in her eyes. And ladies, some of y'all understand this, is it was just like, this is not what I signed up for. When I had these children, I did not think this was going to happen to me. Can I go back in the room and change clothes? And I wouldn't let her do it either. And so I just started encouraging him. And then my mom did what moms do. Because I looked at her and I said, doesn't Andy look great? Isn't this exciting? Y'all are going to be Twinkies all day long? And mom did what moms do. And this is what some of you ladies have done when your child has tried out to sing or play an instrument. It's what some of your children have done when they said they wanted to go into sports and they can't tie their shoes and chew gum and walk at the same time. When they brought that grade home and it was not a good grade and you know that they just weren't that smart. You did what moms do. You lied. That's what great moms do. You lie. You tell them, baby, you can sing. You're ready for American Idol. It's why the whole first three weeks of American Idol exists. It's y'all's fault, mom. Y'all lied to us. It's what happens. It's why we think we're great athletes. It's why we think we can do anything. Really, we can't. Mom's just lied to us. And my mom had this thought of just, I could see that she just wanted to start the day over. And can I just say, moms, some of you have some moments in your week that what you desperately want to do is you want to shine a spotlight on certain parts of your week. And I understand that, and you should want to. Some things that are bright, shining moments. Some things that are Instagram-worthy. But how many of us also have moments where we just have the opposite response? Maybe it comes in a different form or a different fashion, but it's something that you wish you could keep the world from seeing. In fact, you want to permanently delete that picture. You don't want that coming to light. And what I want to say to you is that whether your life is filled with average, ordinary, everyday, Instagram-worthy moments, or whether it's filled with moments that you just wish you could go back to bed and call it a day, that every bright moment, every valley moment, and every ordinary moment in between, if we are faithful in those moments, the Bible is clear that they bring us a sense of wholeness to our lives. And the purpose of Proverbs 31 is to draw attention to the often overlooked glory of the everyday. Moms, we celebrate your everyday. But the author goes on, and he continues to write, and and he says this in another passage in uh, chapter 31, verse 28. He says, her children arise and call her blessed. How many of y'all know this was not written on a Monday morning during the school year? It says, her children arise and they call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you, honey, you surpass them all. Not only is Proverbs 31 a poem, but Proverbs 31 is also a hymn. It's a hymn. Here's what it is. It's, it's a song. It's a love song. But guess who this song is written for? You may find it a surprise. It's actually not written for an audience of women. This song of Proverbs 31 is intended audience is men. It's for us, fellas, because the author of the Bible knows that we love some 80s love song, guys. We love them. And it's mentioned that, I mentioned earlier that the Hebrew alphabet was used in succession to like write this, this piece of, of, of art, this, this song. And one of the reasons that it was written using the Hebrew alphabet is partially to communicate wholeness, but also it's written that way to serve as a memory tool. Because all of the men in the community would memorize this part of the Bible, word for word. And the Hebrew alphabet is used to help guys remember it because the author of the Bible knew, fellas, we need all the help that we can get. And here's what the guys would do is that at a certain point during the week, they would gather all the women in their household and they would collect them in one room. 
So all of the, the moms, the daughters, the grandmothers, the mother-in-laws, they would get them all in the same room. They would sit them down, and here's what they would do. The guys would come together, and they would sing this song over the women in their lives. Over their leading ladies, they would sing about the work of their hands and how they deserve praise. They would sing of how good and how beautiful and how amazing the every day of the women that made up their lives were. They reminded their women of their value. And here's what it did. It also reminded the men of just how great they had it. You see, these, these ladies that have been given to us, these moms, these leading ladies of our lives, guys, they're gifted to us, and they're meant to be treasured. And when I hear ladies talk about Proverbs 31, oftentimes I hear it described as a job description or this laundry list of things that, like, that I just can't keep up with. And here's what I want you to understand. When you read Psalm, uh, Pro Proverbs 31, the only instructive language in Proverbs 31 is actually directed towards the men, not towards the women. It's directed towards the men when it says, praise her for all that her hands have done. It's the only instruction in the entire chapter. And guys, what it's saying is it's saying that you and I have a responsibility to the leading ladies in our lives. When my oldest, Shelby, was born, it was about almost 21 years ago, and when we found out Melissa was expecting, we were excited, and the day finally arrived, and we went to the hospital, and the delivery was perfect, and after everything had happened, the doctor gave us Shelby, and then eventually, the doctor came to us and said, are you ready for the parents? And our parents, who both lived out of town, had, had driven to where we were living, and they were waiting in the waiting room, and we said, yes, we're ready for the parents. And all of a sudden... We heard coming down the hallway this noise. And it was a noise of like people who don't normally run, running. <laughs> it was a noise of both of our moms running and both of our dads shamefully carrying their bags behind them. And apologizing to the patients that our moms were knocking out of the way on the way to get into our room and our moms ran into our room and they ran on both sides of the bed and they kind of showed their personalities. On one side of the bed was my mom and she was just crying, she's a little more emotional. On the other side of the bed is Melissa's mom and she's just praying, she's a lot more spiritual and they're just there and they took Shelby from us and they passed her around and it started this long tradition of ignoring us so they can focus on our children. And they spent all this time like taking pictures, telling her how much more important she was than we are. And then after 20 minutes or so of doing this, you know what they did? Is they gave her back to us, and they left. <laughs> and they went to Applebee's. <laughs> they had no problem. No instruction manual. We didn't know what we were doing. We could barely take care of ourselves at this point. We were still children. And my dad, as he was leaving, he turned around kind of called me to the doorway, and he said something that I'll always remember, but he said, son, we're leaving. I'm not paying for any of this. <laughs> and then he said, son, you know what to do. And what he was talking about was true, is that I had watched my dad for years love and care for my mom, and he had, he had shown me the way I knew what to do. And then dad looked at me, and he goes, I only had your mom. Now you've got two of them. Good luck, buddy. And he left. <laughs> then eventually I had a third, and now I've got a fourth. This is a dog. I've got all females at my house. So it's a lot of estrogen floating around the Lloyd house. I need some testosterone in my life, guys. If y'all want to go work out, get in a fight, whatever I need to do to boost that <laughs> testosterone, I need some help. But here's what I realized is my dad spoke it to me, and when I read Proverbs 31, I'm reminded of it, is that I'm reminded of the power of speaking life into and over the leading ladies of my life. It reminds me that part of my responsibility is to do that. And so many times, life can drown out what we know to do. And guys, what I'm not encouraging you to do is tonight's to gather your wife up and sing Ed Sheeran or Michael Bolton over her. If you do, please record it and send it in. We would love to see that. I'm not, I'm not encouraging you to like copy the method. What I am encouraging you to do is copy the rhythm. Maybe to pull out your smartphone and on your calendar once a week to put it in your calendar to, to date your wife or to call your mom or to, to date your daughters. And because we have this beautiful gift that we've been entrusted with and the work of their hands deserves our praise. Proverbs chapter 31 is it's a poem. It's a love song. 
And then the final thing that Proverbs 31 is, is it's heroic. It's heroic. It's a heroic picture that celebrates the best in the women of our lives. Listen to what the the writer says in chapter 10 of verse 31. He says, a wife of noble character, who can find? A better translation in your Bible is actually this, a woman of valor, who can find? That word valor is pretty interesting. The word valor was usually traditionally used only to describe men in the Bible. But in this passage, the same word that's used to describe men of valor is used to describe this woman. And what's really interesting is that the women in the Jewish communities took this word for what it was. And they not only read this in Proverbs 31, they adopted it in their nomenclature when they spoke to one another. And so these women in this community would use this as a way to celebrate other women. They would see other women in the community do well, and they would speak that into uh, other women. They would say, you are a woman of valor. They would have something good to celebrate and that those are the words they would use. And imagine, ladies, celebrating your friends this way. You see women who have something to celebrate, maybe a promotion at work or or an act of mercy or justice or they're expecting a child or, or a friend who's fighting a courageous battle and you just speak over them. You are a woman of valor. It's the Jewish version of you go, girl. Think of the power Think of the potential in those life-giving words if we spoke that over people instead of, girl, you won't believe what she did. You are a woman of valor. And valor is not so much about what you do, but valor is about how you do it. Wherever you find yourself in life, whatever, wherever your status is, professionally, maritally, financially, Uh, parental status, whatever your status is, whatever your station is, whatever you have your hands to, ladies, wherever you find yourself, be that with valor. Live that life because it's the best life that God intended for you to live. That is what makes you a Proverbs 31 woman. It's not about this laundry list of things that you can never get wrong, but it's about whatever it is that God has put before you, being that with valor. It's not about creating a Pinterest board worthy life. It's about being a woman of valor. Proverbs 31 reminds us that the leading ladies of our lives, the leading ladies of this church, you are women of valor. And then the very end of this proverb says this. It says, give her everything that she deserves. Ladies, if you've never said amen in church before, that's probably a pretty good moment. Today, may your husband spend a ridiculous amount of money at lunch on you. It says, give her everything that she deserves. And then I love this next part. It says, festoon her life with praises. You know what festoon means? I don't either. I just like to say it, and I thought it was pretty cool. (laughs) Festoon her life. So today at lunch, fellas, just look at her and go, I just festoon you. (laughs) Might lead to something fun. I don't really know. But it says, give her the praise she deserves. Speak life over the leading ladies of our lives. And today we honor the depth and the beauty of the women of valor in our lives. And here's what I would love to do. In our remaining time, I would love to, at every campus, line up your campus and have one by one the, the moms and the ladies of our campuses stand up and tell their, in story, tell their stories and share the things about their life that are things of valor because they are beautiful and they are inspirational and they deserve to be told. But we don't have time for everybody to get on the stage. So I thought what I would do is I would tell you a few. A few stories of some women of valor at Life Point Church. Women like Amanda Casella. Amanda Casella is in this interesting stage where she's got young children and she's living in between one of the most exhilarating times of her life. There's a lot of new dreams and new things on the horizon, but at the same time, she's living in one of the most, let's say, frightening times of her life. A few months ago, after a barrage of tests and, and knowing that something was wrong, she was given a diagnosis that no one wants to hear, and it was a diagnosis of leukemia. And during that entire stretch to today, she maintains this this positive spirit. It is said of her that she stands strong in her faith, and it radiates through her face. She still has the biggest smile, the warmest smile, all while working full-time, taking care of two kids, and following her dreams alongside her husband, Rob, of opening up their own ice cream shop in town called the Wandering Cone Creamery. I love the name of that, and ice cream is spiritual. So Amanda, we just want to say to you, you're an inspiration. You're an inspiration as a mom, and you're an inspiration as a fighter. 
And here's what your church family wants to say to you, is that we're believing that your story is going to be an inspiration of God's grace and power when you are made whole and when you're healed. We're believing that for you. You guys agree with me? We believe in that for Amanda. I think about Mariah Geis. Mariah Geis attends our Leland campus, and she and her husband Aaron, they've been married for about 11 years, and early on in their marriage, they had a dream, much like some of the dreams that you guys have had. They had a dream to start a family. But like some of you guys have run into, it seemed like roadblock after roadblock in making that dream a reality, and they struggled with infertility. Maybe some of you guys are in that that same season. And like some of you, they saw specialists and they went to fertility clinics and they had a lot of just unexplained reasons why they were struggling with with infertility. And those unexplained reasons and those roadblocks led to feelings of frustration and feelings of defeat and, and the tension of seeing people that they loved and cared about quickly get pregnant and start a family while they were desperately trying and praying for the same thing that just didn't seem to happen. And it led to, in all honesty, a season of questioning God, but ultimately ended up by surrendering the process to him. And can I tell you that after seven years, seven years of praying, of trying, of going to doctors, of doing everything that they could on the heels of a procedure, can I tell you that after seven years, God answered their prayers. And she got pregnant and they welcomed baby Ezra into the world. Yeah, amazing. And one of the reasons I tell you that story is because we asked that, she would, that Mariah would encourage those of you across our campuses who may be walking through your own season of infertility. And here's what she says. She says, for those of you who are still waiting, I know where you are. I know where you've been. I know that it's not easy. But now I see that God's plan for me was way bigger than the plan that I had for myself. And then hear these words, ladies. Hold on to him. And in the end, his plan he'll reveal for your life too. I think about a mom like Missy Stark. Now, Missy is a personal friend of my wife and I. We, we go to the same gym with Missy, and we've known that Missy was an amazing mom. And Missy has this quote where she says, having children is like having your heart just walking around on the outside of you. And Missy has walked through some pain with her husband. They've walked through pain of, of losing their daughter through a late-term miscarriage. Maybe some of you guys have walked through that same thing. But Missy... And her husband had a, an unexpected bout with a, a kind of pain that none of us as, as parents ever want to experience when their son Rowan was diagnosed with leukemia. And Missy proved what all of us who know Missy know about her. She proved that she was a warrior. And she proved that she can lead her family into battle. And through their own season of uncertainty and their season of doubt and anger and fear and ultimately faith, They walked through that season. Missy says of that season today that God makes no mistakes and he knew that I needed to be their mom for such a time as this. And after a lot of treatment and after a lot of time, can I tell you guys that Rowan's cancer went into remission and that little guy today is healed and healthy and whole and we just celebrate with Missy and her entire family. Hey, something so cool that happened in Rowan's life is we have something we do. It's a 24 hours of, of praise and worship that we do once a year here at LifePoint. We just came out of uh, a season of that. And a year ago when we had that, we have uh, on the wall, we had a wall written where you could go praise God for something he had done miraculous in your life. And Rowan walked up to that wall and he wrote that I am free of cancer in Jesus' name. And so to me, Rowan's an inspiration to all of us and so is Missy. And hey, can I tell you what? To every mom... You're a woman of valor, and your story's impressive, too. It's inspiring to all of us. It's funny, when I think about those ladies, and when I think about the the woman in Proverbs chapter 31, I think about something that that Missy said about her season, when she said that for her and for Brandon and for their entire family, that while those times were hard, while it was like storms were just coming on top of their lives, that it was during those storms that their connection to Jesus took root. You know, the Bible describes our life and how our life can be built on a couple of different things. It describes it on one hand that it can be built on a a sandy foundation, kind of an unstable foundation. And Jesus describes it that if we build our lives on 
on an unstable, sandy foundation that just like for those women that I highlighted their stories and just like the Proverbs 31 woman and just like so many of you, that the winds are going to blow and that storms are going to come and that life is going to happen and sometimes it's going to happen and it's going to seem really intense and really painful and if we're not careful and if our life is built on the wrong foundation, it is going to blow the entire house down. But then Jesus said there's a better way. In fact, he says, it's the reason that I came into this world is so that you don't have to build your life on on a foundation that's really no foundation at all, but you can build your life on the rock, on the truth of knowing, surrendering to, and trusting your life to Jesus. You can build your family, you can build your marriage, you can build your career, you can build your hopes and dreams, you can build your life on the person of who Jesus is. And so when those same rains come, and when those same winds blow, and when the same life happens, that's happening to everybody else over here that's rattling the foundations of their life that you can stand strong. And just like Missy and just like Amanda and just like Mariah and just like so many of you that could tell your story better than I could, that your life is not shaken because it is built on Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but whether it's Mother's Day or any other day, it's a great day to uproot our foundations from over here and to rebuild them on the person of Jesus. So can we bow our heads and close our eyes? And across every campus, I would love to pray for you. And for those of you today who are in in one of our rooms, in one of our campuses, and for you, your life is defined as being built on something other than Jesus. And maybe for you, the winds have blown and the rains have come and you feel that foundation shaking. And today is a day for you to take your life and to rebuild it on the person of Jesus. And it simply begins with surrendering your life to Jesus. The Bible's clear that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. And it says that our life can be built on the firm foundation of Jesus when we confess our sins to him and we receive his forgiveness. And if that's you today and you're ready to make that decision with no one looking around, would you just pray this prayer with me? And there's no magic in these words, but would you use these words as a guide to have your own conversation with Jesus today? Just say these words to him. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of my sin. I recognize that my life is built on something other than you. Forgive me. Jesus, I confess my sin to you, and I ask you to forgive me. Say these words. Say, Lord, I surrender my life to you. Today, I commit to make you my Lord and my Savior, and I commit to follow you for the rest of my life. Now, with no one looking around, no movement in any of our campuses, if you made that decision today, we would love to know about it. And the way you can let us know about it is in just a moment, I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you prayed that prayer and made that decision. And no one in the room is looking around except a very small team of people. And when you raise your hand, if you would leave it lifted, They're going to come to you and they're going to place a card in your hand and we'll tell you what to do with that card in just a moment. But if you made that decision on the count of three, would you let us know by raising your hand? Are you ready? One, two, three. Across every campus, if you prayed that prayer, you made that decision, would you lift your hand? At our Pine Valley campus, I see one right here kind of in the center in the back. Across every campus, we'll give it some more time. If you made that decision, just lift your hand high and one of our team members is coming to you. We'll give it a few more seconds. All right, you can put your hands down. I'll tell you what, LifePoint family, can we put our hands together and congratulate that decision today?